Chapter 19 Albus Dumbledore Interlude Albus Dumbledore was having a very good day. He'd had another vaguely blurry dream about himself as a lad and some other boy with blonde hair whose name he couldn't entirely recall, and the emotions accompanying it had been agreeably joyous and pleasant. He planned to start his day with a nice cup of tea before he tracked down little Harry and convinced him that it would be in his best interest to remain in Grimald Place where it was safe. Rather than go gollivanting off to Gringotts he'd bribed one of the goblins there to keep track of the poor boy's visits, and to ensure that the lad never found out about his lordships and the bothersome things his parents had left to him in their will, which he'd sealed, as was his right as chief warlock, where anyone could have simply snatched him off the street. He only had a fifth-year Hogwarts education, after all, and wouldn't last very long in any sort of legitimate battle with Death Eaters. Albus did not believe that his summoned hero had actually managed to kill Tom, at least not permanently. He knew that Tom had made at least six horcruxes, and there was truly no way for his summoned hero to have known about those if he truly had tracked down the Dark Lord and defeated him. He preferred to use words like defeated and vanquished to promote the idea that Voldemort was not really human, and thus words like killed and murdered were inappropriate. Albus also did not believe that his summoned hero was actually death, despite how the man had chosen to introduce himself. Why, he'd known a wizard back in the twenties who'd gone by war, but his real name had actually been Stephen. Death was likely a title he'd given himself due to his experiences in his old dimension, rather than a job description. He wasn't worried about his new hero, though. The ritual he'd used had been very specific in its description, and he knew he wouldn't have summoned anything that would pose any sort of real threat to him. One of his conditions had been that whomever he summoned could not be unforgivably evil he had not specified that his hero be light, however, as he knew better than most that the best way to fight fire was with fire, despite the impression he tended to give his order members and as Albus considered himself a paragon of goodness, his hero couldn't conceivably bring harm to him. Without being deemed evil by the parameters of the ritual, it was all rather clever of him, he thought. He'd had this theory proven several times over the past few days when his hero had passed up several opportunities to harm him in favor of following dear Harry around instead. Albus was not entirely sure what to think about the odd bond growing between his two chosen heroes. It was most definitely a good thing that the man he'd summoned had formed an attachment to one of them he would be less likely to betray them or go against Albus' wishes if he'd formed a positive rapport with someone in the order but he was worried that the hero whom he'd called, who was unfortunately, quite dark in both manner and bearing, would corrupt little Harry. If Harry were to ever grow out of the conditioning Albus had carefully put the lad through over the years, he might stumble upon some things that Albus would much rather keep hidden. The boy had to willingly sacrifice himself, after all, and he would not be quite so eager to do that if he realized he didn't actually have to live with his relatives and had a considerable sum of gold waiting for him in Gringotts. Harry had to believe that his life was worth less than that of everyone else's, else Albus's entire plan would be worthless. The boy had already proven to be immune to the imperious, and Albus had theorized that the basilisk venom and phoenix tears in the boy's blood would render him remarkably resistant to any sort of mind-altering potions. There was also no guarantee that should anyone other than Tom actually kill the boy that the horcrux would be truly destroyed. Knowing the Potter luck as he did, it was equally as likely that the boy's soul would be the one destroyed, leaving the Horcrux in charge of its own magically gifted body for the first time. That was the absolute last thing Albus needed, a second Tom Riddle running around wearing the face of the boy who lived. Albus was certain that the Horcrux still existed in the boy, despite his claims otherwise. The lad hadn't really tried to give a convincing argument in the first place, honestly, having a Horcrux removed from a living vessel by a touch? No. Albus was sure the Horcrux was still intact, and the lad had merely convinced himself that it was gone to prevent unnecessary trauma. Albus heaved himself out of bed and studied the golden cup that his hero had left in the order's meeting room, which doubled as the kitchen, the other day. It looked remarkably familiar, but more and more things had started becoming rather blurry in his memories recently. As much as he hated to admit it, he knew he was getting on in years. Memory loss was not entirely unprecedented for a man of his age, wizard, or no, and he was sure that whatever thought was connected to this innocuous little cup was not that important. If it had been, 
he would have stored it in his pensiav for safekeeping, and according to his research storing memories in a pensiav locked them in place, preventing one from forgetting them in the first place. It was why he put so many of his more important recollections there, such as the time he, the time he, well, it wasn't, important. It was far too early to be trying to recall such heavy thoughts, anyway. Smiling good-naturedly to himself, Albus stepped away from the bed and stumbled as a fretful squawk sounded by his feet. He looked down and saw Fox resting in a scattered pile of ashes a few yards from his bed, looking the worst Albus had ever seen him. Albus tooted as he reached for his original wand which was not nearly as powerful as the elder wand which he still needed to get back from his hero and levitated the phoenix and its ashes back to its perch. He was an old man, now. He couldn't be bending down every time his familiar decided to be reborn somewhere inconvenient. Albus would have thought by now the phoenix would be able to tell when its burning days were, and would know to land somewhere. Appropriate in time for it to happen. He supposed he wasn't the only one who was forgetting things nowadays, Albus chortled to himself, ignoring the odd looks Fox was sending him. By the time Albus had made it to his office he'd spent ten minutes picking out his robes for the day, the brighter the color, the more people tended to underestimate him and think him utterly barmy, which was ideal. For his image a rather irate Minerva McGonagall was waiting for him. Ah, Minerva. Albus still remembered when she was a student, she had been one of his favorites, a true transfiguration prodigy. It was a shame that he could never bring himself to tell her that her old schoolgirl crush Tom Riddle had gone on to become the Dark Lord that would kill her parents and eventually kill her husband. It wasn't all that important, he figured, it was best to let such ugly truths remain secret from those who did not truly need to know. Finally, Albus. Minerva snapped. Oh dear, Albus thought amusedly. She's already growling at me and it's not even noon? I need those reports on the school budget I sent you. Do you have them ready? I really need to get them to the governors before they start poking. Their overlarge noses into Hogwarts business. Of course not, Minerva, Albus replied with a twinkle, ignoring the odd look on his deputy's face. She was likely still cranky from being made to wait. I have far more important things to do than worry about the school budget. If it gets tight I'll simply dip into the founder's vaults again to cover it like I usually do. Minerva had the strangest look on her face. Albus wondered if she were well, it would not do for his deputy to become ill, especially not now that he was so busy with the war and couldn't handle his regular duties. Minerva was such a dear to pick up the slack now and then. Albus, what are you talking about? Minerva asked him, looking oddly concerned. He simply smiled at her and pushed more magic into the spell he used to make his eyes twinkle such a useful spell, that... It helped disguise the signs of passive legilimency, not that he could use it against Minerva since she was an accomplished Eclomans and would likely notice. Fear not, Minerva, he soothed her, I'll attend to the budget as soon as I convince dear Harry to stay at headquarters where I can keep a close eye on him. Another of those odd looks was aimed his way as Minerva slowly nodded. Very well, Albus. I'll be in my office if you need anything. He nodded with a benevolent smile as Minerva slowly backed out of the room, still eyeing him strangely. He would have to flow Poppy and convince her to pay Minerva a visit she was clearly unwell. With that out of the way, Albus hummed cheerfully to himself as he headed for the fireplace. The passive wards he'd woven around headquarters had informed him that Harry had returned last night, and now would be an ideal time to confront the lad about his outing. He was positive he could guilt the boy into staying in the house from now on, and if he timed it right he might even be able to do so without his newest pawn being present. It would not do for his new chosen hero to overhear anything. That might make him suspicious of Albus' motives. As he emerged from the fireplace into Grimald Place, Albus twirled his old wand and silently banished the ash clinging to his clothing. It was always good to keep in practice with silent casting, especially if there was a chance someone could catch you doing it and be impressed. He sent a silent pulse through the wards to locate the boy he was here to confront, and found him still in his room. Sking at the propensity to oversleep inherent in teenagers these days, Albus headed for the stairs. Why, when he was a lad he was up with the dawn every morning. He could hardly fathom why the boy needed so much sleep, especially since school was not even in session. If this was a sign of laziness, Albus would have to find a way to fix that. The chosen one even if Albus did not intend for the boy to live long enough to revel in his fame could not be lazy, after all. There were locking and silencing wards on Harry's door, 
but Albus ignored those and dismantled them. The boy had probably just put those up to keep out the other children young Ronald was arriving today and bringing his delightful little sister with him. Albus knew that Harry was uncomfortable around the youngest Weasley, and it made him chuckle every time he saw them together. It was like James and Lily in reverse. Albus had just put his hand on the door when it was pulled open from the other side, and he found himself staring into the wide, fanged grin of the hero he had summoned. An unsettling chill ran down his spine, and Albus inwardly frowned at this odd reaction. He would have to cast a few warming charms around the place if it were cold enough to make him shiver like this with the slightest draft. He had been hoping to avoid confronting this man until he'd dealt with Harry's little rebellion, but perhaps this was an ideal time to get his wand back. The death stick's power made up a great deal of the magic behind most of his spells he wasn't getting any younger and he truly could not leave it in the hands of someone who was so obviously dark. Ah, my boy Albus faltered as something in the man's face subtly shifted, and the wide grin was suddenly neither friendly nor particularly reassuring. I had hoped that I might speak with young Harry about his unapproved outing the other day, but since you're here I'm afraid I must insist that you return my wand to me immediately. It is simply too powerful to be left in the hands of someone who does not follow or obey me. The man's impossible grin widened further. Albus wondered what sort of glamour the man was using to achieve this effect, as Albus was quite capable of seeing through most illusions and yet couldn't quite pierce this one. Perhaps he had cast it using the Elder Wand? That would certainly account for its seeming solidity. The wand does not belong to you, mortal, the man told him in that horribly hoarse voice of his. I will not be returning it. The man paused, and his lips closed over his teeth in a strangely polite, accomplished sort of smile that Albus had yet to see from the man. I do so. Appreciate your honesty in this matter, Dumbledore. I am pleased to know just where I stand in regards to yourself. Albus smiled back genially, a bit confused but eventually figuring that the man had realized that he had been summoned by Albus, and thus should follow his orders like he was meant to rather than this odd sort of bizarre independence he had previously exercised. Of course, dear. Boy, Albus studiously ignored the way the man's sharp fang snarl made his magic shudder and recoil into his core, I shall simply demand the return of my wand at a later time. I have too many things to do to spend much of it arguing the matter, you understand. He twinkled reassuringly at the man, earning a strange sort of vaguely threatening grin in return, before the door was closed rather abruptly in his face. Well, that could have gone better, but at least the man was coming around to Albus' way of thinking. Humming to himself and reaching into his pocket for a lemon drop, Albus headed back down the stairs so he could flow back to his office and deal with the budget poor Minerva had been so worked up over. He dearly hoped she was not coming down with anything, that would be most unfortunate considering how he had planned to push much of his paperwork onto her in the coming days while he dealt with tracking down Tom's horcruxes. Sometimes it just didn't pay to get up in the mornings. That's the end of this chapter, thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe for more and to help this channel grow. See you next time. Bye.